Morning. Morning. Pastor John. So what are the people shopping this morning or what? <laughs> well, they're still having coffee. Huh? Is that what you say, Rihanna? You saw them having coffee. Uh -huh. You also wanted, but you came too late to have coffee and be in here on time. So you left the coffee. So, but did Gideon have coffee? Nux. At six this morning. Okay, after your run at six this morning. So the rest of the people here take note. He ran this morning, then he had coffee this morning. What's your problem? So what did you do, Groves? <laughs> you sorted your water situation out. Well, yeah, I understand in Whitbank that could be a, a legitimate thing. So we'll let you off this time. <laughs> you swam at 5 o'clock this morning. Where? In your pool at home. And then you still drove through. Yeah. And next birthday you are? 80. That's in October. Yeah. Nah. So what's your problem? <laughs> You're yeah. I told, I told Pastor Lynn many years ago, he's got to stop intimidating me. <laughs> because uh, in the middle of the winter, he comes to, to, to meetings at church, you know, and we have a meeting and it's like 10 degrees outside. And he comes in his short sleeves. And I've got puffer jackets on and jerseys on and he comes in his short sleeves. And, uh, you know, it makes you feel like, as a man, like, you know. Man van Stahl and softy, you know. But then fortunately, you know, I have to say that everybody else has got the puffer jackets on too. So maybe there's something different about him rather than us. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. But uh, I mean, it's an amazing thing. All the years we've been together, every winter, it's like when you see he's got a jersey on, you know it's really cold. Yeah, and then we've got heaters on and he comes in and he takes his jersey off because the heaters make him hot. So, <laughs> praise the Lord. And he also, up until a couple of years ago, used to swim mostly through the winter even. You still do. Don't intimidate me now in front of everybody, <laughs> Pastor Lev. <laughs> praise the Lord. Well, it's always good to be in the house of the Lord, and uh, I am I'm grateful that God has given us an opportunity to have this weekend that we can do this together. Uh, first fruits is a is a very very special thing. First fruits, it's very special. If you have an understanding of what first fruits is. It's, it's, the most, it's the most powerful uh, example of, or most powerful activator of the blessing of God in your life. So, Jesus was the first fruit. And that in itself should be the one, should tell you a whole lot. 
Amen. And so, uh, Pastor Christy was one of the first fruits of people that became disciples in this church. And so she's going to come and minister to you this morning. And to me. I'll be sitting on the front row. Pastor Christy, come and share the word of the Lord with us, please. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Pastor John. I just want to have you agree with me in prayer that everything that she says is blessed of the Lord. And she will speak as God calls her to speak and says what she needs to say. And that we are all ready to receive from the Holy Spirit what comes through her in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Amen. John. Thank you so much, Pastor John. Well, like you can see, uh, I'm aiming to be like Pastor John fully. I'm not yet only on my iPad. Um, <laughs> Pastor John is by a papira. <laughs> uh, I, I must still put it on my list to cross over. But the, iP the iPad is working very hard, Pastor jo John, when you are ministering. But then, then if I have to minister, I'm more like Pastor Sherman. They're going back to my files and going back to my papers. Pastor John, thank you for the prayer and for the blessing. Good morning, everyone, and wonderful to be in the house of the Lord. Hallelujah. Will you please open some straight away your Bibles in Romans chapter 11, verse 16. Most of my scriptures will be in the Amplified Bible. I'm going to dive in straight away. I would like to share with you, just like Pastor John said, about first fruits, but in the light of our crossover, discipleship, territory, and repentance. So we're going to dive deep this morning, Pastor John. Hallelujah. God wants us to have dominion. He wants us to govern through the continuous, perfect state of being. Praise the Lord. Romans 11 verse 16. For if the first fruit is holy, the lump is also holy. Paul says, if the first part that you are giving to God is holy, the rest will be holy. Let's read the second part of that scripture. It is as important. If the root is holy, the branches will also be holy. Now, I want to take you straight away to Matthew 6, please, in your Bibles. Pastor John spoke about it yesterday and actually... I had to stop myself not to summarize everything he spoke about yesterday, and I'm al almost there. We're going to see if God says something is holy. Pastor John described it very beautifully. But let's just see it again in the Word of God in Matthew 6, verse 9 to 10. Jesus says, Pray therefore, our Father who is in, hev in heaven, hallowed be your name. That means holy and set apart holy and set apart please let's go to ezekiel let scripture speak this moment of this this morning thank you lord um did i say ezekiel i'm going to just ask you before we go to ezekiel 44 please go to deuteronomy 26 in the flow that god's got for us this morning hallelujah If we say something is holy, it's set apart. But it's very important that we listen to the language that God is bringing us through Pastor John. Holy is the perfectly integration with God's will and not our own will. So this weekend is the actual bringing of our first fruit offering to the Lord. This is glorious. Let's look at Deuteronomy 26. This is the only one I don't have in my notes here, but I think there's a few more. And um, Pastor John prayed, but I want to add this prayer this morning. Lord, we pray that you will receive our offering as a sweet-smelling aroma to you. Because this is our crossover. First uh, uh, fruit offering. You're going to hear this morning, it's actually very important to bring it. And not only to say it, 
very important in the word of the Lord. Now, Deuteronomy 26, look there at verse 1. I'm working from the New King James Bible, and you will see that it talks about offerings and first fruits and tithes. Now, go and have a look and study that whole chapter, because that's what it's talking about. Offerings, first fruits, and tithes. Then we jump to verse 17. Today, the Lord says, you proclaim. You see, we are actually bringing our first offering, and our seed speaks. We actually make a proclamation today. Today, the Lord says you proclaim the Lord to be your God. Not to take the holy days for yourself anymore, but to consecrate and bring them to the Lord. Look at verse 18. You see, when, you're, when you give your seed, when your seed speaks, God is going to speak back directly. God is so wonderful. The Lord says, also today, the Lord is proclaiming. So yesterday already we started to hear the word of the Lord. And today we're going to continue with that. Also, the Lord proclaims that you are his special people, heritage of faith. Just as he promised uh, our forefathers, we can walk in all the promises today. So this is our prayer that what we are actually bringing God is acceptable to him this morning. Hallelujah. Well, you know, when Pastor John ministered these few weeks, uh, when Brother Dennis was here as well, God is already proclaiming and answering us. God is amongst us as the supernatural. So by studying the word of God today and looking at first fruits, Lord, we declare that we're going to skip things. We are going to pass over things because it is the pass over. So we bring this as holy unto you, Lord. Now I'm going to take you to Ezekiel chapter 44. There's so many wonderful scriptures, but this one is a very important one in the Old Testament. We've started in the New Testament. Ezekiel chapter 44, verse 30. The word of the Lord says, and the first of all the first fruits of all kinds. I really just want to read that again. And the first of all the first fruits of all the kinds. It can be money, it's your income, it can be produce, it can be houses, it can be your first book, it can be the first sound and uh, 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 song CD uh, album that Pastor John sowed. And of course, we see here today, it is our holy days. In the New Testament, by the leading of the Holy Spirit, it will always be what the Holy Spirit is showing it to be. Not because we work it with a formula, being led by the Holy Spirit. So let's read the rest of the verse. And please take note, it's the first of all the first fruits of all the kinds and every offering of all kinds from all your offerings shall belong to the priest. And oh boy, we're going to go there today. You shall also give the priest the first of your coarse meal and bread dough that a blessing may rest on your house. And Pastor John went there yesterday that a blessing may rest on your house. This blessing you and me cannot receive by someone laying hands on you. This is very important. They brought the things, the first fruit things. Now, if you're not bringing it, you are not giving it. You see, if you did not come, if it was not purposed in your heart to come this weekend and not, not to use the holy days for yourself like we did in the past, we, we're also going to talk about that today, our repentance of what we did in the past. But you had to make a choice to actually set this apart this weekend and, of course, this year to bring it, to, to, to cause it to be holy, that the blessing may come on our house, the house of the Lord first, and then, of course, our houses. Pastor John said this so beautifully. What does it mean to be blessed? When God says, if you obey me, 
there's just certain things in his way, in his ways and in his principles. If you're going to obey me and follow my commandments, then everything that you do and where you go, the continuous perfect state of being is already there to make the way that the things will turn out perfectly for you. Thank you, Lord. This is God having a high regard when we obey and we bring him the first and the blessed. Every believer, every believer, you will not ask one believer and say, no, I don't want the blessings. We all want the blessing. But we have to practice the principle that gives God the legal right to cause the blessing to come onto your house. And first of all, the house of the Lord. Blessings on your house. Now, a house is not only the natural building and the structure. And of course, it includes this. But I want to show you here. And please go to Genesis 14. I wanna, uh, I'm not going to go too deep into this today. But you will see why we are touching this. Genesis 14, 14. Now, when we talk about a house, yes, number one, it's the church. It's always the individuals, the sons of God. It is the congregation. It is the assembly. If you talk about assembly, you talk about ecclesia. It's governmental. It's judicial. It's the house of parliament. It's lineage. It's generations to come. So just an example in um, Genesis 14, 14. When Abram heard that his nephew had been captured, he armed almost 400 trained servants born in his own house and pursu uh, pursued the enemy as far as Dan. Now, out of Abram, uh, Abram's house came an army, sons in his house that will make up a household. You must first be a spiritual family before you can actually be called a house. So this is very important. I'm going to take you to Leviticus chapter 23, verse 10 today. When it comes to tithes and offerings, we're going to go there. God has already chosen and determined how and what we will give him because he is God. There is a history, his story about people bringing their tithes. There's a history, his story when you bring and how you bring your first fruits. So Leviticus 23 verse 10. Tell the Israelites, when you have come into the land that I give you and reap its harvest, you shall bring the sheaf of the first fruit of your harvest to the priest. Now, in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, they brought the first fruits to the house of the Lord. They gave it to the priest. There is protocol. Later, we will talk more about that. And the priest would receive it and lift it up before the Lord. By the leading of the Holy Spirit, when Pastor John asked me to minister, I did not think I would go where the Holy Spirit led me to go. We're going to go deeper today talking about first fruits. Like I said, we're going to talk about first fruits in the light of our crossing over, plantedness, discipleship, the ecclesia, territory, and repentance. Can you really connect all of that with first fruits? You're going to see. We have a covenant cry this morning, and we say, Lord, healing, cleansing, and anointing. This is our hearts. When you bring your first fruits, and I, I really want you, it's so wonderful to be here with your family members, people that you are sitting with, and this is for us as a congregation, as the ecclesia. But it starts with your and my understanding. It really starts with my and your understanding how to walk in the ways of the Lord. Please go to Malachi uh, chapter 1, verse 6 to 9. Very important to lay this foundation. Because when you bring your first fruits, you are doing two things. And you may never forget this. When you are bringing your uh, first fruits, two things are happening. Number one, in your actual bringing it means you are giving it. Many people talk, but they never bring it. It's an act of consecration and an act 
of alignment. So Malachi chapter 1, verse 6. A son honors his father and a slave his master. If I'm a father, where is the honor due me? And if a master, where is the respect due me, says the Lord Almighty. It is you, priest, who show contempt for my name. But you ask, how have we shown contempt for your name? By offering defiled food on my altar. But you ask, how have we defiled you? By saying that the Lord's table is contemptible. When you offer blind animals for sacrifice, is that not wrong? When you sacrifice lame or diseased animals, is that not wrong? Try offering them to your governor. Would he be pleased with you? Would he accept you? Says the Lord Almighty. When Pastor John shared with us about Cain and Abel, we have this understanding already in the congregation. It's not to say that God's going to accept our offerings because it has all to do with the heart. How you purpose and how you live with God. Is he first? Do you first give to him? Do you first seek the kingdom? It all has to do with the heart. Pastor John knew we had to bring our best, not just a few services, but absolutely the best and the first part in this weekend. Let's look at Genesis 22, verse 1 to 2. God will not take our blind and lame offerings. Now it came to pass after these things that God tested Abram and said to him, Abram, and he said to him, here I am, Lord. Verse 2, and then he said, now take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on the mountain of which I will tell you. I really want you to get the, the, the uh, magnitude, like Pastor John says this morning, of what it means to give first fruits. This is not just for, for Isaac or for any pastor. You must listen with the ear for your own life today. Isaac was the first fruit offering of Abraham. It could not be Ishmael because that was the flesh. It was Isaac. We are praying currently for Israel and we will always, but do you really know why no one will be able to destroy Israel or why they will stay a nation? Because Abraham consecrated them, Israel, to God through his first fruit offering of Isaac before Israel existed. If the first one is holy, the rest is blessed. Because they were given to God through the act of giving, the act of giving first fruits by a son named Isaac, then God could bless all the others that was coming. Abram did not know that this would happen. How could he? He did not know. He did not have the full picture. Why the continuous, perfect state of being can be so smart to bless a nation by his act of first fruits giving. This is profound. This is profound. Pastor John said yesterday the gift um, that he and Pastor Sharon would sow into JD's life. They did not have the full picture of what would be happening. They just obeyed the Lord and God could do beyond what they thought. What do you think can a legitimate an ecclesia before the Lord do with an offering, a first fruit offering, what we are willing to give God? Not only this weekend, this whole year to come. Abram could not see this coming. Why did God ask Abram to sacrifice his best? I mean, his son that he loved. Why? Lord, Abram almost believed 20 years. It took almost 20 years for uh, uh, Isaac to show up. Because God is first even in what he grants you to have. We may never forget this. You cannot take an answer from the Lord, a blessing in your business, 
in your family, anything that you have believed God for, it doesn't matter how long it took. You can never take that blessing and that outcome and put it before God as more important. This is where we are maturing as believers. We cannot do this. Genesis chapter 22, verse 16. I love this. I've already shared a bit there, and we're going to go deeper. So Genesis 22, 16, and God said, I swear by myself. Just look at this. Um, Abram sowed. The seed is speaking. Like Pastor John yesterday said, our seed was speaking. God could do things beyond. The seed is speaking, and God is answering. This is always how it will be. And God said, I swear by myself, declares the Lord, that because of this thing that you have done, I will not withheld, uh, uh, um, because you did not withheld your son, your only son, again, I will bless you. And God says, Abram, this was so important that you did not keep a backup plan. Now I can trust you with all the things that I am doing. In 2018, you will remember, Pastor John ministered every moment for your future. Where you start is not where you're going to end. By faith this morning, what we are giving the Lord this weekend and what we are giving him this year is not where we're going to end up. Pastor John yesterday said, we believe God. He will show us how we're going to spend our holy days, days of rest and blessings because he already goes ahead there because he has prepared that for us. This is not where we're going to uh, um, end. Every moment for our future as we obey God. Praise the Lord. You know, we will never stop saying this to one another by faith. By faith, Abram offered Isaac. By faith, by faith, we are coming this weekend. By faith, this year, we will continue to give God our best. Now, this is very important. Pastor John said, and it already had a very big impact in my life in 2018 when he, when he said this. When Abram did this, it was not a test of faith. The test of faith was to push through to receive Isaac. That was the test of faith. But to, to offer Isaac was a test of the future. A test for what's waiting for us by God. Genesis 22 verse 7. I'm just quickly going to show you this. I wanted to skip this part, but I know in my heart. I must just show you this morning because let me tell you, I heard the sounds. You will be confronted by your offering. You will be confronted by your offering. Genesis 22 7. But Isaac spoke to Abram, his father, and said, my father. And he said, here I am, my son. Then he said, look, the fire and the wood is here, but where is the, the offering? And then verse 8, Abram said, my son, God will provide. How many of you thought, must we really come all the services? Your offering will speak to you. You better be ready for that. You better be ready for that. So God is not going to ask you for not your best. And because you're going to give your best, your soul, your emotions, and people around you will say, what are you doing? I am giving God my best. But spiritually, and the spirit man must always be ready because your, offer will, your offering will talk to you. Remember, I've said to you that when you bring your first fruits, you are doing two things. It's an act of consecration, just like um, I gave you an example of Abram. And then in the second place, it's an, it's an act of alignment. Now again, we're going to talk about plantedness, discipleship, and the apostolic. Please go to Malachi 3 verse 10. We're really going to go deep this morning. How can we talk about plantedness, the ecclesia, and the apostolic when we talk about first fruits? You will remember how many times Brother Jerry said, Many people were planted in his church. God called those people to, to him, but they did not walk with me. Divine alignment for assignment. Now, Pastor John can tell you the same thing. Let's read Malachi 3 verse 10, New King James. 
God says, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. Now, God is talking about God's assembly and the congregation here in my house. So, ah, I've, I've, I don't know if you could get it right for me. I've, thank you. I've asked you to put Malachi 3.10 on the board, but uh, I just asked them if they could do it the way Pastor Sharon ministered it to us. Do you remember when Pastor Sharon brought the word about the tithes and that not enough? Meaning God says, bring your tithes and your offerings. But it's just beautiful to see if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such blessing, not enough, because the yellow should not be there. Can you see the italics? I've, I just wanted to put that on for you. But I want to go back to the beginning of the scripture. Bring your tithes uh, uh, to the house of the Lord. It's talking about the congregation. So bringing your tithes is a covenant connector. And we've talked about that. But I want your ear to hear this this morning. Bringing your tithes connects you to the house of the Lord. That there may be food in my house. Enough in the house of the Lord. So bringing your tithes connects you to the household of the Lord. It connects you to the pastoral care. Very important to see this. It connects you where, where God is planting you because he's not planting you with all pastors. And there where he's planting you and you bring your tithes so that there may be enough in his house, it is specific about the pastors, the pastoral care that God is connecting you and me to. So the house of the Lord, the Levites and the Old Testament and the priest, they ate of that tithe. They ministered in the house of the Lord, but, but, but I was in awe when the Lord showed me this. Those Levites in the preach, just like what we do in this ministry, the first fruit offering goes to the high priest. The first fruit offering in this church is not coming to Pastor Malusi or Pastor Garth or to me. It goes to Pastor John. It goes to the senior, the visionary leader. So your tithe connects you to the house, and you do have the blessing of the pastoral care. But then the, the, the first fruit offering will be offered up to the high priest. Look what the New Testament says, Hebrews 3.1. Therefore, holy brothers and sisters, also set apart ones, who share in the heavenly calling, fix your thoughts on Jesus, whom we acknowledge as the apostle and the high priest. God makes the connection between the apostle and the high priest, not us. This is apostolic. Jesus is both the apostle and the high priest. So by bringing your tithes to the house of the Lord, we are blessed with the pastoral care that God's got for us. But that first fruit offering belongs to the high priest. That is apostolic. We cannot, we cannot go into the territory, occupy what we've got to occupy, receive the blessings that we've got to receive without the apostolic order set in place. You know what, uh, uh, Brother Dennis, when he ministered, you heard this. He confirmed every single thing Pastor John ministered about. He also said, sheep just want to be sheep. Don't want to come to church. Just want to do the easy thing. Pastor John brought that message. But listen to this. I was just in awe when the Lord showed me this. Brother Dennis said, most churches are not being led by the apostolic. They are being led by pastors. Not in this church. Not in this church. But can you see it for the first time? Can you see tithes and first fruits, like Pastor John said, how significant this is? Pastors are the ones to care for the people. But none of them is called to be strategic and moving God's people in strategic directions. That's the work of the apostle. Very, very important. Now, still your own life, you and me, we are listening this morning. We all want impartation, but you cannot have impartation without alignment. So where are you taking your tithes? Where is your first fruits going? 
because alignment talks about plantedness, it talks about discipleship, because your tithe must go to the right place. You know what? When God showed me this in this week, he showed me this. I got up uh, 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 um, in the morning and I said, Lord, I don't want to say this. He said to me, I've showed you this. You have to say this. Who are you called to? Judas was God's choice to walk as a disciple with Jesus. Jesus says in John 17, Father, those that you gave me, the disciples, Judas did not want to walk with the Lord. And listen how the Lord gave it to me. And I had to get another one. And I had to get another one. Everyone here, the Lord said to me, I must share this with you. Everyone here in heritage of faith, we've got a choice. We know that we are called divinely aligned to, to our Lord Jesus, and we're going to talk about that, to our Lord Jesus and Pastor John, called to him. The Lord gave it to me. God wants to know today if you will take your place or must he get another one. He had to replace Judas. And then even the second choice, the rich young ruler, did not say yes. So he had to get a third one. He will get a third one. I believe a fourth one. He will. But it's, it's, it's been given to you and me by our Lord Jesus. And why do I say it like this this morning? This is your journey. God brought you here. It's not just for me and Pastor Garth and Pastor Malusi and some people to take their place. God is asking you this morning. He brought you here to be in divine alignment with Jesus and Pastor John. For some, the Lord said, this is hanging in the balance now. So, thank you, Lord. I have to go. I have to speak about territory right now because when you talk about territory it's apostolic adam and eve lost territory because they have exchanged with satan they traded sin for the dominion they traded away the dominion that god gave them territory was given away territory can only be taken apostolically jesus the apostle and the high priest he took back, that's what he did on the cross, he took back the lost dominion. And now through Jesus, our, the apostle, we can only get territory back through the saint ones, the apostles, from the apostle. You will never be able to take territory. It's apostolic. Jesus took it back on the cross. But for us to occupy for us, for Pastor John to build and to go in the, in the territories that God has given him. For me and for you to do what God has called us to do. You cannot occupy and go into spaces and places if you are not aligned to the apostolic territory that's been given to you as a believer. It is apostolic. It is apostolic. So... Pastor John shared with us uh, 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 Genesis 1.26, and I'm not sure if we have put that on, and it's not the end of the world. I just want your ear to hear this, because Pastor John ministered on this. Just listen, and God says, let them have dominion. Let them have dominion. God did not say Satan. He did not say the fallen beings. Let them have dominion. And he got that territory back. Hallelujah. Pastor John shared with us about the fallen angels and the demonic powers. They are spirit beings. They are creatures around us all the time. You just can't see them. These are principalities and powers. They are legitimate rulers of this world. How can they be legitimate rulers? Because like where Adam and Eve, or people today, like Pastor John said, through words, give away territory that's supposed to be yours, you can still give it away. Why are we giving our first fruits, our holy days? Because number one, God is bringing correction to us. Because we have exchanged with the enemy. 
The enemy has hijacked God's holy days, and we worked with him. We did exchange. We did. Why do you think the eye exchanges, and we are all eye exchanges, they are here to exchange their plans with God's plans. If we are not exchanging our plans with God's plans, we are exchanging with someone else. So when it comes to holy days that Satan hijacked as holidays, we worked with him. That is why the enemy has the right and the realm when it comes to holidays. I've shared with the uh, I exchanges last week, just to use an example. The enemy has the right and the realm because we know this for years. If summertime, if you want to go to Europe, you're going to pay for tickets. If December times, everything is more expensive and we learn to live with the death toll on the roads. Why? The enemy has the right and the realm. So we have to repent. We have to repent and we will talk about this. This year and this weekend is the actual bringing of our first fruits because God is bringing correction to our lives. Pastor John said in Isaiah 55, 6, let the wicked integrated person, we were there, we have to repent. Let the wicked integrated person forsake his interaction so that he can exchange for a different integration with the Lord. That's why we are here this morning. That's why we are here. Alignment being planted under apostolic authority. Um, when Brother Dennis came now a second time, I saw when he ministered not only to our congregation and to other people and things came up in my heart. And I had a conversation with the Lord and I, I thought back to my own lawless days where people wanted to do all sorts of things with blessings and curses, just like Pastor John said yesterday, wanting to work with bloodline cleansing and the way they're interpreting the Bible. And I said to the Lord, Lord, I saw many of those wrong things, but I said, Lord, many of the things that they talked about were right in principle. And then the Lord answered me. He said to me, Christy, just like in your, your, in your lawless days, people touch the principles, but they do not have access, apostolic access. They see the principles in the word of the Lord, but not being planted, not being aligned, not being submitted. Um, they do not have, and this, you know what, the Lord gave it to me when Brother Dennis was here. When I sat there yesterday and Pastor John said, you know what, the Holy Spirit is just on me to, to use this language. This language, the Lord said to me, they do not have the words and the language to access the places and the spaces they're supposed to access. They don't have it. So they will be all over the place. I was all over the place. The principle is there, but you have no apostolic access because you are not planted. So please go to Jeremiah 23. Now, Jeremiah 23, Pastor Sharon has and will always still minister powerful about it. It is talking about the shepherds. And the prophets who go and do things, but God says, I did not tell them to go. They, they steal the words from one another. That's, they're not from the Lord. They're doing their own thing. Now, this is very different what I'm going to read you here. We are called to our Lord Jesus and to Pastor John. Now, those legitimate, you remember when the Lord said to me when I was planted in Whitbank? Now you are under legitimate spiritual authority because Pastor John is my saint one. I mean, it, it, it changed my whole life and I know yours as well. Now I want you to see where these words and the language is coming from. An apostle. Uh, I'm going to show it to you and then I'm going to talk about Pastor John and Pastor Sharon. Jeremiah 23 verse 18. This is so powerful. Who has stood in the counsel of the Lord and has perceived and actually heard his words? Not just taking words from one another and speaking about it, but actually hearing his words. Who has marked his words and heard those words? His legitimate sent ones. 
that stands in his counsel, in his presence, being led by the Holy Spirit to bring words and the language that gives access. And you know what? And this is why I have all my, and I do have it on my iPad, but no, yeah, the paper is just wonderful. I mean, I, I can tell you this because personally it changed my life. And, and I hope you get it. And I want to say to all of you guys today, you have to get your behind sight in Bible school. You've got to come and be trained in the word of God. You've got to come and sit at the feet of Jesus and learn. This whole revelation about the ecclesia and the apostolic, I did not even know that God would grant me the privilege of being in the ministry. I was in business with Chloe's. But when I received the truth of God's word, it changed everything in my life. Everything. Business changed in, in, in such a, dry, a, dr a dramatic way. Where do you want to go and do business and occupy the spaces and places if you're in the wrong place and you don't have apostolic access? Where do you want to go and do that? Of course, chase in the world system. The apostolic anointing is on Pastor John that gives us the access to spiritual truths and passages uh, uh, um, into heavenly realms, into deep spiritual truths. I mean, I had books and CDs and things, and with all of those things, I could go nowhere. And many people today are going nowhere with that. So the, uh, the apostle provides the passage from one spiritual dimension to another. Um, and we will talk more about that. I just want to say this. Oh, thank you, Holy Spirit. When I've asked the Lord about this thing coming out of my uh, um, lawless days, the Lord said to me, Christy, anyone planted. That's why it's so important, businessman. Every gift that God is calling to be around Pastor John, the apostolic crew. He said to me now, by Pastor John's uh, uh, invitation and being around Pastor John and Sharon, he says, only now you may speak because you will bring forth through plantedness, through being in the right divine alignment with the one that I've sent to you. Your gift can and will and must not have anything to say. If it does not speak through plantedness, divine alignment, unity, submission, irrational honor, what do you want to say? Because then, of course, we are lawless. And this is not who we are as a people. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 18. Now you are no longer strangers and uh, foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and the members of the household of God, having been built on the foundation of the apostle and the prophet, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. Now I want to go a bit further. Nothing will happen if Pastor John did not receive the apostolic calling. But the Lord said to Pastor John, the time has come to build. I have witnessed the years by God's great grace, 20 years ago, where people wanted to go. Pastor Sharon had a word from the Lord. It's too slow. Nothing is happening. Away I will go. Pastor John was laying a foundation. But now, Pastor John is building. How, is God's, how will he build? With the apostle and the prophet. Where are we getting the words and the language in this house? From the messages, from the apostle and the prophet. God will not build any other way. You will not have access any other way. Those are the words. That is the language that God is giving us. Hallelujah. We will not come with other words. That is why so many believers touch the principle, but they have no access into what God has granted for them on assignment. Territory given to an apostle. So you will remember Die had a song from the Lord. Holy, holy, holy territory. Step into this place with me, says the Lord. The moment that happened, we all knew that's apostolic. Do you remember that Sunday morning that was very powerful before Pastor John and Kit went to do the epic? Pastor John said, 
When he said those words, I knew immediately what was happening. Pastor John says, before you sit down, you should tell somebody, I'm glad that I'm not doing the epic and Pastor John is doing it for me. Do you remember that? I can tell you, when Pastor John said that, I turned to Grobis and I've said to Grobis, Grobis, I'm so glad I'm not doing the epic and that Pastor John is doing it for me. I made a spiritual declaration because I knew it was apostolic, that everything that Pastor John is giving his yes to the Lord, everything that he will work with God here will now break open for me. I took it, that was not a light, just good morning, hello. I knew what Pastor John was saying. Then Pastor John said, me and Kit, we have trained. Thank God that we have been diligent. We have been faithful. We have explored every opportunity. Everything that we need to do, we've explored to get here. That was one of the things where, why God said to me in the spirit. But even when I saw Pastor John before he ministered, ministered it's done. Even in using those words, it's apostolic to explore. It actually means to travel for the purpose of discovery, a geographic expedition, to travel like an apostolos, to penetrate into territory. It was done because of Pastor John's yes and his preparation before the Lord. It's territory. It's territory. Now, I want to start to end with two very important points, and I want to take you to Isaiah 56, verse 7. We are still going deeper because of this first fruit offering that we are bringing the Lord. Pastor Sharon has so powerfully ministered about this word over and over again, and will still go from glory to glory in the name of Jesus. Isaiah 56, verse 7. These I will bring to my holy mountain. I want you to listen. And give them joy in my house, holy mountain, in my house, house of parliament, it's house of prayer. Their burnt offerings, what are we doing here? Offerings that we are bringing to the Lord will be accepted on my altar. For my house, my house on this mountain will be called a house of prayer for all nations. God says, I will bring my people to a holy mountain. And that, of course, is through, not only through Prayer Connect. Pastor Sharon said in the One Prayer Connect, every time we pray because we are planted, called to legitimate apostolic authority. If you pray in the morning, if we pray at PGG, we, our prayer language is full of legalities full of legalities because God brought us to this place. Now, I want you ear, your ear to hear this morning. Mountain speaks of a place of government always. God gave his 10 commandments at Mount Sinai in the Old Testament. And I just quickly, I'm not going to go deep into this, but I want you to see where this mountain is, where the ecclesia is. Look at Hebrews 12 verse 22. I've also asked them to do something for me if they could do it on the screen today. Ah, can you see I've asked them to highlight those words. As a born again believer, not because you, one is more special to the other one. As a born again believer planted son of God with your giftings and callings that should be in the apostolic crew around Pastor John. Where are you? It's Isaiah 56 verse 7. Where have you come to? Where have we come to? We have come to Mount Zion. That's the mountain of the Lord. We have come to thousands of angels. Look at verse 23. We have come to the church. That's the word ecclesia. It's judicial. It is uh, 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 um, all the activities of the ecclesia on the mountain of government in God's, uh, uh, um, in his house. And then uh, 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 continuing from verse 23, um, verse 22, you have come to the thousands upon thousands of angels. Verse 23, to the church of the firstborn, whose names are written in heaven. You have come to God, the judge of all. To the spirits of righteous men made perfect. Many people are talking about the cloud of witnesses, but like Pastor John and Sharon says, it's the righteous ones we write here with God. 
to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, to the, and pass over to the blood of sprinkling that speaks. Pastor Sharon went there, the cleansing flood of the blood to keep on cleansing us anytime we make a mistake. We have come to this place. But I want you to see today that this is the mountain. It's the place of government, the judge of all. That's where you find the ecclesia. Then the Lord showed me this, Luke 17, and I've never seen this before because of the apostolic. I've never seen this before. Luke 17, verse 18, Jesus rebuked a demon and it came out of a boy and he was healed at that moment, but the disciples could not. The disciples came to Jesus in private and asked, why could we not uh, uh, drive out this demon? Jesus replied, because you have so little faith, very, very important, I tell you, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move. And then the Lord showed me this. I saw what God wanted me to see. The Lord said to me, Christy, I'm not talking about the Drakensberg. I'm not talking about the literal mountain. I'm talking about a mountain, a place of government that the enemy owns because of territory being given to him. It's a legal place to govern. That's the mountain that Satan has. We are on the mountain of God, the Ecclesia. You know what? Recently in one of our education meetings, the Lord said this to me. He said to me, Christy, this mountain of education, it must move. Now, in this ecclesia, I knew immediately when God was speaking to me. He said to me, I have given an increase apostolic. That anointing on Pastor John is increasing to pray for the nation. The Lord has called Pastor John to create apostolic order in, the, uh, uh, in education. What is the ecclesia in its simplest form? The called out ones of God. To, to overrule the called out ones of the enemy. The enemy, they do have their mountains given to them. It should not have been, but they own those mountains, those, ter those territories. So the Lord said to me, we're not going to fight them. Why is it so important in Pastor John's walk? Every single time Pastor John is talking to the Lord, God gives him territory territory. We have it in this city. We have it in this nation. We don't have to go and fight Satan. We have to come with the words and the language God is giving us to have the access to take away play, uh, spaces and places from the enemy. That's what we are doing. When we have, for example, education meetings, we know this is not difficult. Do you think we do not see the giant in front of us like we see all the other giants? No problem. It's not your territory anymore. It's been given to Pastor John. We only come to say, we only come to use the words and the language that we don't get in another place, that we get in the place where the apostle and the prophet is building the way that God builds his church. And that goes for all areas of our lives. So you can see how big this is. You know, I brought two of the last messages here with me. I just sometimes do that, take them out of my big file. And you guys know you've got it on your iPad. But Pastor John keeps on speaking about repentance. And I want your ear to hear this morning. It's so important. That's why I'm using the words in the light of. In the light of the word and the truth that's coming to you and me, you cannot turn dark in the light. Now, we've missed it in the past. We have sinned. The Lord said, don't say you, 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 you have not sinned. Then you deceive yourself. The enemy did not see repentance because he had no chance to repent. But repentance is such a wonderful thing to be cleansed by the blood of Jesus. We just have to, in the light, say, your Lord, this is what we have done. Pastor John shared this with us yesterday. It was so powerful when he read the scripture, and I'm going to close with this now. 
just two more scriptures. Pastor John read from the Young's lit literal translation, reform you for coming to you the rain from heavens. Jesus is saying, there's an old way you have been living. Repent from that old way because come to you is the way of heaven. Yes, Lord. This is what's coming to us and we need to repent. I want to I wanna finish with this because I want you to see it for yourself. Um, 1 John 1, 7 to 9. We love verse 9. I'm just going to jump there first, uh, 1 John 1 verse 9. If we freely admit that we have sinned and confess our sins, he is faithful and just. Sin is a legal issue. You see those mountains that the enemy, that the enemy may have. We have to repent and say, Lord, we have missed it. We have missed it. But then the pure blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us and judicially. How do we want to be the ecclesia, the house of parliament, interceding and coming for the nation and coming for the city, but we do not repent and then that thing is not just before the Lord. The same thing for your personal life. The same thing for us as a, as a congregation. So, Pastor John also ministered, come and ask for forgiveness. Jesus died so that we do not have to be judged. We don't have to be. Lord, in the light of the truth that's coming, we see, Lord, we run to you. Thank you for the pure blood in your veins, Lord, because it's not running in my natural veins, but in Christ Jesus, I come for the cleansing flood of the blood. And then I'm going to end with Colossians Two, verse 13 today. I want you to see this. This is one of the scriptures that the Lord gave me regarding education, but it goes for everything that we do in the ministry. This apostolic team, that includes you in your praise in the morning for the nation, in your praise in the morning for Pastor John. How can you go there if you do not pray for him first and come in, in that slipstream, come in that wake? We see these mountains, we see these mountains, but God is giving Pastor John the territory and we're going to take it. This is a profound scripture for us to understand what it means to occupy the spaces and the places that God's got for us. Uh, Colossians 2 verse 13. And you being dead in your trespasses and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, he has made us alive together with Jesus, having forgiven all our trespasses. Does your Bible say all? Yeah. Mine says all. Now listen to this where we stand in covenant with him. Having wiped out the handwritings of all requirements that was against you and me, which was contrary to us. He took it out of the way, nailed it to the cross, because that's what we have. And then the Lord said to me, Christy, in the light of the messages, you come and you repent. You come and see to it that this thing is just and right between you and me. Because if you come this way, if you are planted in the place where you must be, he says now in your time, I did this on the cross. It's nailed on the cross. But in this apostolic crew for us to walk it out, he says in your day, I want you, I'm going to publicly, it's already the principalities are disarmed, but publicly I'm going to make a spectacle of them in your day. This is what we are doing. This is how Pastor John is building with the whole apostolic crew around him. Every and anything we touch, where your gifting is coming in, where you have to slot in. Judas, must God get another one? Because in our day, to come and govern and not just be sheep that wants to come to church now and then again. God says, I've already disarmed them. But because you take that territory that I took back and I'm giving it to Pastor John. He says, come to me and ask me for this because I am making a spectacle of them in this ministry, in this assignment, and in everything that we've got to do. And we say, yes, Lord. We say, yes, Lord. I just really want to leave this with you today. Repentance is very important. 
We cannot just look at the word of God and think, oh Lord, I see what you mean and then do nothing. I cannot do it. You cannot do it. In the light of the messages, in the light of the words that God is bringing you and me, in the light of the language, so important what happened yesterday. That's why, I mean, I made notes like never before because I, I really want you to just understand this. Pastor John said it so beautifully. God said, use this language that you don't get stuck, that you can access the realms of revelation the way the word came to us yesterday. How many of you, because of the continuous, perfect state of being in me, and through you, Pastor John said it this morning, how could God ask Abram to give him his best? God says, because I did it first. Before the foundation of the world, the lamb was slain. You think God's going to ask Abram or you and me to do something that he did not do? That perfect state of being, God in us, and then God said this to me. He said to me, why do I show you this, Christy? He says, let's talk about occupation. If Christ is the first, God gave Christ for many Christians. And now we have that perfect, our God, perfect, beautiful, continuous state of being in my heart and your heart. How's that for occupation? The Lord said to me, let's talk about governing and ruling and reigning. So this seed that we are giving, do, can we even have a picture? And then the Lord said, can we have a picture of what this ecclesia is doing to really in the light of the word to repent, really in the light of the word to come in the words and in the language that God is bringing us. For the first time, I personally understand how God can take a nation and a culture. He said to me, you that traded with the enemy and you took your, you made, you helped the enemy to make my holy days holidays. Now you are repenting and you offering up to me the first fruit. What do you think God can do with this gift in a culture? He can shift a culture. He will shift cities and he will shift nations. It is apostolic. And this is what God wants us to understand today. We will go deeper. We will go higher because God is giving Pastor John the territory personally and in the ecclesia together. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. We just want to say, Lord Jesus, on this day, thank you. Oh, Lord Jesus, that you, Father, we want to say to you, we will never forget. It's in your word. It's in our lives every day that you so loved. You so loved that you gave us your best. We just want to say to you today, it's our desire to so love, so love you, to continually give you our first and our best. And we all say, Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Pastor John. Thank you, Pastor Christy. Wow. Hey. Praise the Lord. What a wonderful teaching the Lord has given us through a teacher this morning, a pastor teacher. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Well, uh, before we have a, a, a short break, I just want to uh, re-emphasize what Pastor Christie has just said. I ask you a question today. Would you, would you rather have perfect planning or perfect obedience? So I, I face this challenge all the time that uh, I, I change plans that we make. 
And I know that when I change our plans as a church, it has an impact on your plans and the plans that you make. And I've had to face this with the Lord because I'm aware of the impact that planning has on the ministry. And so, you know, when we, when we first planned to have meetings this the weekend, I, I was before the Lord about it, and, and so I wanted to give out of the, the shepherding component of what we do together as a people that lived together for many, many years. So I want you to just understand the foundation of what drives me and drives us. It's, it's more beneficial for me. It's, more, it's of a greater value to me that we live together for a long time and we grow together for a long time in God than to have lots of people that fill big buildings, but they come and go. So this is the way God called me. I'm not judging any other ministry. I'm just saying that's the way God calls me. I see how God calls a people together to walk together a long time. So I've seen people that are involved in ministries where they, a lot of people come, a lot of people go. They use the people resources. And most often those people get burnt out in a few years and then they leave the church because they're not valued for their walk with God. They're valued for their gift. They're valued for their energy and how they can serve the vision of the church. And I've not only watched it, I've been part of it. So in all my dealings with the Lord, I've said, Lord, you obviously, when you dealt with Abraham, with Isaac, with Jacob, with everybody, you had long-term legacy in mind in every relationship that you have. You don't have a, a vision that is the major thing that destroys relationships because of the abuse or the use of excessive energy. Get you this time, do this, do this, do this. And the more you give, the more the ministries will take. And so I'm always in this place with the Lord where I, I, I care for the long-term amount of energy that you give into the ministry because I want us to live together for a long time. I don't want you to burn out. I want you to be steady, stable, established and have a, a place where you can give adequate time and energy to your wife, to your family or your husband, your family, the things, the other things that you need to do in your life. So I... I Attempt always to live as a ministry with understanding, with that long-term plan in mind. So when I initially came out with the timing for, and the plan for this weekend, and then later on the Lord was dealing with me and he said, but Johnny, this is first fruits. You better give it the best you got. Don't hold back. So then we changed the plan. So I ask you, what do you want more? A perfect plan or perfect obedience? So if that's true, then that should apply to your life too. If you're making plans that are the total thing that controls your life and you never change a plan for what God says, then you are not, you're either doing one of two things. You so perfectly have from God that actually every one of your plans are God's plans then I need to introduce you to Jesus. Because as far as I know, he's the only one that's ever been able to do that. So, I'm just being uh, real with you today. That I'm always seeking the Lord about what's next. And what's next. And sometimes in my own conversation with God, I, I say, all right, Lord, I'm hearing you. I'm hearing you. You want first fruits. So let's do this first fruits. And then the Lord has to deal with me. And he says, no, John, that's not enough. You've got to do more. And then, and then I'm saying, but Lord, what about the people? And he says, I want your obedience, John. Let the people decide for themselves. And you set the standard of obedience and let the people decide for themselves. 
So what Pastor Christy is saying is we can't take territory if we are always living with our plans to such an extent that our plans are so structured that God can't use us to take territory because sometimes territory has got to be taken when there's a God-created moment. We can't occupy places when there's a God-created moment and we're not ready for it. Because we're so busy doing our plans, we can't hear God's plans. Because God, don't you dare change my plans because I'm a planner. I'm structured, I'm organized, I'm planning, I've got allocated resources to the plan. It's part of my vision. I know what's going on in my life. Well, I've got to go this way. Well, I'm sure that when you've got all of those things and you say all of that to God, God says, go for it. Go for it. It's yours to run. Go for it. But there's nothing that's happening in your heart that says, actually, Lord, everything that I'm doing is actually available to you. Change it. Change it. Whatever you want, change it. So that's why I say to you, and I have said to you the whole weekend, thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank you for making your time, your energy, your effort and if any of you have changed holiday plans to give time for holy days, I thank you. And may the Lord bless you. And may these revelations that God has brought to us and is continuing to bring to us, may they, may they make the difference in your heart. May it be the difference maker. May it be the enlightener. May it be the aligner. May it be the, the, the thing that blesses all of the rest of what we can do in our lives. Amen. And so I, I, I'm just wanting you to know that always, even from this day onwards, everything that I do, I do measured carefully what is the impact on the people's life. Pastor Christy will know, all the other people will know. I call them into meetings. How many holidays? What, what are the school holidays? What are the private school holidays? What are the, what are the big major things that are happening? Sometimes I'm even aware I have done that in the past. I don't do it anymore because it's nonsense. But even times when the Springboks were playing in New Zealand and having a big game at a big time or kind of stuff like that, I'd say, if we're going to do that, half the people are not going to come to church because they're going to be watching that game. Because that's what they planned. So I don't do that anymore. I'll tell you this. The church in America, this is a real thing. The church in America stopped having Sunday night services a long time ago because they were competing with the National Football League, NFL. So they stopped having churches because people didn't come to church anymore because their team was playing. And so now the whole culture has changed in America that church is no longer had on Sundays because of NFL. Because the pastor said, why is the point of having church when everybody's staying at home watching NFL? Huh? So I'm sharing with you today the tension that exists when someone who's leading people that you know what you do, you've got lives to live. But at the same time, the more we give our lives to God, the better our lives are going to be. And so we're all actually wanting to lead better lives and have better in our lives and more in our lives. And uh, the whole thing about it is not give me more time so I can have more time and less time for church. Actually, the thing is, give your first always to God and then you have a better life. Everything gets better. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Pastor Christy, thank you. Great teaching. Hallelujah. Aren't we blessed to have Pastor Christy as a shepherd in the church? Hallelujah. Yeah, we are blessed. You know, I mean, this happened to us at that time. You know, Christy and Krobis were doing business together, and between the two of them, they created a good business, and, and they were making good money. And the time came when I had it in my heart. Pastor Christy, you've been faithful in serving the Lord here in this way and still working, and it's time for you to come into the full-time ministry and, uh, and come and do this full-time. And, you know, there was a conversation we had to have because, uh, because of an income level change that would have happened in their business. And at that time, I, you know, I said, I can't give you, I can't make up the money that you guys are earning. I can't do that. 
but it's time for you to come. Aren't you glad she came? Aren't you glad she made the transition and said, okay, Lord, we'll, we'll, we'll do so that we can be obedient. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. So let's take, what's at 20 past now? Let's come back at uh, 25 to 11. Let's, 20 to 11. Let's make it 15 minutes or so. And uh, you can have a cup of tea outside and then we'll do the next session. Amen. Everybody say, Amen. And let's do it again. Amen. <laughs> change everything about you he will make all things new he's here right now for you you don't have to wait any longer one you're looking for is here He's standing right before you knocking Open up and let him in Jesus is the one who can save you He's alive and knows your All you need to do now is answer And let Jesus come right in He knows you He loves you He cares for you He knows now for you you don't have to wait any longer the one you're looking for is here he's standing right before you knocking Open up and let him in And let Jesus come right in The voice of my shepherd, no other I know. The voice of my shepherd tells me where to go. He leads and he guides me in every way. I listen to only what he has to say. He speaks through his word. prophets he speaks through his word to his prophets he's the shepherd of my heart he's the shepherd of my life My 
The shepherd of my heart. He's the shepherd of my life. And forever I'll follow him. He's the shepherd of my heart. He's the shepherd of my life. And forever I'll follow him. And forever I'll follow him. I worship you, Almighty God. I worship you, King of my heart. I worship you, Abba Father, everlasting Counselor. I worship you, Almighty One. I worship you, Glorious Son. I worship you, Savior of man. Great are you, Lion and Lamb. I worship you. I worship you. I worship you, Emmanuel. I worship you, who's with us now. I worship you. Wonderful guy, spirit of truth, giver of life. I worship you. I worship you. I worship you, my king, with all the love I have within. I give you all. Praise. I worship you, my God, with every love. 
worship you, Jesus who saves. I worship you, your holy name. I worship you, the spotless lamb who takes away the sin of man. I worship you for who you are, the morning light, the shining star. I worship you, light of the world. Oh, glory to the good shepherd. I worship you. I worship you. I worship you, my King, with all the love I have within. I give you all. I love you Spirit I love you with all my heart Father I love you Jesus 
Jesus, I love you. Spirit, I love you with all my heart. I'm drawing close in this moment right now to give you my love in this song and this sound. You are wonderful to me. from my heart that I sing. You are my master, my Lord and my King. You are wonderful to me. Father, I love you. Jesus, I love you.
Jesus, I love you. Spirit, I love you with all my heart. Father, I love you. Jesus, I love you. Spirit, I love you with all my heart. Every day I know your love It's wrapped around me like a glove I'm into you You're into me Your love is like an ocean wild I'm jumping in just like a child I'm into you Love is sweet, your spirit intoxicating The finest wine, my God, that only you are making I'm intertwined with you Coiled in the vine with you I'm all wrapped up, I'm Can you take this away? Thank you, MP. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Continuous, perfect state of being. Continuous, perfect state of being. You know, this is a, a perfectly correct statement to make. You can wake up in the morning and say, I'm perfect. And I determined to be perfect continuously today as I live in a state of being with my Heavenly Father. You can, you can declare that about yourself. Because your spirit man is perfect. Amen. It's your mind and your body that's got to get adjusted. Hallelujah. So, we're going to continue with the theme. A continuous perfect state of being. I, you know, 
I'm so glad Pastor Christy touched on all of the things of first fruits because Jesus was the first fruit. And because Jesus was the first fruit, we are, all of the rest are blessed. And if we are serious about doing what we are doing this weekend for God, and we are, then everything that we do in the future is blessed because this is our first fruit. Amen. Matthew chapter 5 verse 17 says, uh, the New King James Version, Matthew 5, 17. Do not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For assuredly, I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot or one tittle will not by no means pass from the law till all is fulfilled. In other words, there is nothing about the law that won't be fulfilled. Whoever therefore breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches men so shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say to you that unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. So let's go to continuous perfect state of being. Remember, what we were talking about yesterday, that Jesus came from the place where the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit have eternally occupied. So where they occupy, the place that they live in, we call it heaven, the Bible calls it heaven. Uh, he came from there to an, a place on the earth and he came as a continuous perfect state of being. And he came and he said, if you want to know how to pray, pray that whatever's in heaven will come to earth. Yes? So when Jesus is talking about himself, he says, I never came to destroy the, destroy the law and or do away with anything the prophets spoke about. I came to fulfill them. So these things, what the law and the prophets stand for, will stand forever until heaven and earth passes away. So anybody that's trying to put a different emphasis on the importance of the law and the prophets, they can't enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, this is quite important because uh, what was happening is that there was a whole movement <clears throat> within the covenant people of, of God, the Jewish people, the Israelites, there was a movement where there were so many added laws that people had to keep that they interpreted the laws because life was changing around them. So now they had been occupied by the Babylonians. They had been occupied by all different kinds of people centuries ago. And then now they were occupied by the Romans. And different behavior patterns emerged. And different things were happening. So what would happen is that all the, all the lawyers, the people that were leaders of the law in the community, the the rabbis and all of the people, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they would all come together and bring their interpretation of how to live the law. So you had the Ten Commandments of Moses, and then you had the law that God gave people to live in society together with understanding. And if you read, it's, sometimes it's difficult reading, but if you take the time and, and you read through books like Leviticus and Numbers, <laughs> it's, it's challenging reading, but uh, 
But if you take the time and you read it, you will find out that God's got lots of information there that he's line upon line about how to live together. And he goes into details with things like, if you find someone has stolen something from a brother, then this is the way that you must be able. He must repay it, and he must repay it like this, and he must do it like that. And if he doesn't repay it, then you must do this. And then God also talks about things like, you know, uh, interest rates and many things are all in the Bible. And so those, that's what's called the Levitical law. So you had the law of Moses, and then you had the Levitical law, and then you had the law that was the law established by the leaders of the Jewish people that was the interpretation of the Levitical law and Moses' law. But what was happening is that as circumstances were changing, the children of Israel were, were put under under this pressure of so much behavioral, behavioral law. And so they always had to be doing something, doing something, paying something, and it was creating a whole lot of societal issues. Well, I, I, I reckon the same thing has been happening in the church for quite some time already. And this scripture says, who effort, uh, uh, who, who therefore breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches men so shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say to you that unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. So he was saying, all these guys that are interpreting the law for you, unless your righteousness exceeds theirs, you won't enter into the kingdom of heaven. So they look in and say, but these are the guys that are supposed to be the righteous guys. What about us? He was already telling them that your righteousness is not going to come from how well you do and don't. Your righteousness is going to come from seeking the kingdom. Right? So, this passage of Scripture is right before you get into Matthew chapter 6, where Jesus begins to talk about the kingdom. Right? So, when Jesus is talking about it, I've said to you before, law is the order of God. And, and how many of you think that any of the laws that God gave Moses are irrelevant today. Let's go through it. What about murder? I think it's pretty relevant. What about uh, stealing? What about uh, envy and greed? And lying? What about those things? Right? I mean... On the contrary, I think society is built on those Ten Commandments. So, for us to say that we live in a, in a whole world where the law is no longer relevant, it's impossible for us to say that because all of what we have in Christianity is based on the law. It's the law of God to His people. It's the law of the continuous perfect state of being says, this is what I am. I don't kill. I don't steal. I don't lie. I don't do these things. This is not part of me. This has become part of humans. So if you want to know how me as the continuous perfect state of being am, you can't live these things and be connected to me. So if you do these things, then you have to shed blood to get a repentance or to have a forgiveness of your sins because any of these things that you do is not me. So if you miss the mark, you've got to pay the price. So every time you miss the mark, you've got to pay the price. So here's a set of 10 commandments that reflects me. If you do any of these things, you're not living like me. So then what happened over all of the years is God sent people, messengers, into the earth. He sent people into the earth. And the prophets 
and I'm, 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 I'm setting us up, okay, for some prophetic things that we're going to talk about that is, that is going to help us get a better understanding of the difference between the church and the way the world thinks. So God had messengers come into the world called prophets. They were not rabbis. They were not the, the priests. They were not kings. They didn't, they didn't fulfill any governing function on the earth. Their sole reason for coming to the earth and being on the earth was to be a mouthpiece for God. So they would come and they would declare on behalf of God to the people what God wanted them to know. So the Bible is full of things where prophets spoke. So the, the way that the Bible has been structured according to the, the way theologian, theologians want to do study the Bible is they call them the major prophets and the minor prophets. If you go to Bible school, you'll learn some of these things. Major prophets and the minor prophets. So you have a major prophet like a major prophet would be Isaiah, for example, and Jeremiah and Ezekiel. These are major prophets. They, they are so-called ones that had a major message to preach to or, or messages for the children of Israel. And then you would have minor prophets, and minor prophets would be people like Habakkuk and Joel and different minor prophets, so-called minor prophets, because they didn't have long prophetic words, and they didn't often speak about long-term things that were going to happen. But they had a message for the here and now for the people of Israel. Major prophets, minor, broadly speaking. Okay. But God had these messengers come into the earth, and for the most part, these messengers uh, would address a situation that was happening in Israel at that moment, sometimes they would say, you must repent because your behavior is uh, abhorrent to God and this judgment is happening because of your behavior. You're supposed to be like God. You're supposed to behave like God. You're supposed to be His people. And now you don't have blessings. You are under a curse because you've gone away from the laws of God. Why is God sending people to talk to His people like that? Because he wants them back. Right? He wants them back. He wants them to be his people. Most of the time, most of the time, the prophets would say, this is why I've come to speak to you. This is your current behavior pattern. This is what I have to address about you. This is what you've done wrong. This is what I, 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 I don't like about your behavior. Now, but if you will repent from your ways and you will do this and you will do this and you will do that, then I will bless you and I will return you to and I will restore this in you and then you will have all of these things. Most of the time, that's what would happen. Some of the other bigger prophets, people like Daniel, Isaiah, Ezekiel, Jeremiah, they often had a prophetic word that not only addressed the current affairs of the current generation, but they addressed the affairs of things that would happen until the time of Christ and sometimes beyond. So Daniel, for example, example when he had his vision that he had, he had the seven-week vision, which not only addressed the time until Jesus was going to come, but also his vision included the time after Jesus was going to come. So his vision that God gave him addressed a whole period of time. Isaiah, for example, most of what he talked was about the current condition of Israel, but the condition of Israel that would prevail at a time when Jesus would come, and then when Jesus would come, this is what would happen. And so you have, you have the prophetic word, and, the, and the, the government will be on his shoulders, and it will be a government of peace. And, and so he prophesies Jesus coming, what's going to happen to Jesus, and who Jesus will represent, and what will come after Jesus. Amen. So what I'm describing to you now is a continuous perfect state of being that has a continuous perfect relationship in his being with his people. And as his people come close, 
He blesses them. He, they're on track. They move forward. As they go away, He brings judgment to them because you've got to come back. I can't let you die in your self-sin. I can't let you die in your idolatry. I can't let you die in your choices because I have a covenant with Abraham and my covenant with Abraham says, I must bring you back. So the covenant in Abraham was not only established with covenant Abraham himself, but as Pastor Christie said this morning, it was a covenant that was established because he was ready to sacrifice Isaac. So because he said this, I will bless you and now I can bring Jesus and sacrifice Jesus. So when Abraham did that, all the children of Israel and their disobedience, the coming and the going, he had to judge them, bring them back, bless them, peace. They go away. They serve idols. They do follow after other gods. They forget about God. They forget about his ways. Judgment. Come back. Pattern. Pattern. It's a pattern. It's a pattern. When Jesus came to the earth, he said, I've come, I've come to bring the continuous perfect state of being. And I myself am going to represent the continuous perfect state of being. And if you believe in me, then the continuous perfect state of being will live in you. When that life force comes to live in you, you now have the power to no longer follow the pattern. Eh? So that's why when Jesus went away, he dies, he comes back onto the earth, and the apostles, and there are many people that are a witness to Jesus. As he's walking on the earth, there's a witness. If I get a chance, we'll talk about his journey from Jerusalem to the town of Emmaus, and He's walking with two disciples and he, he, the Bible says he hides himself from them so they don't recognize him because he wants them to talk to him about what's going on in them. You think Jesus is about to do anything on his own now that the Father didn't want him to do? If he hid himself from them so that they could talk to him, it's because he wanted to be able to say things to them. So, but as he is walking with them and they starts to open the word of God to them and share the word of God with them, they get to a point where they get to town, they invite him in, they break bread together and then he's gone and then they realize it was Jesus. And they said, didn't our hearts burn within us as he shared the word with us? What was happening? What was happening is that they were experiencing a born again experience because the word of God impacted them, the word burned in them and they were following the Messiah. Hallelujah. So they immediately, immediately they get up and they walk back about 20 miles, the Bible says about 20 miles, they just walked 20 miles. They had a meal together. It's night time. They don't worry about robbers and thieves and all that kind of stuff. It was a big problem in, on the roads in those times. Caravans and people, they would be constantly robbed. And walking just two guys alone was just a no-no because it was very dangerous. But they get up straight away and they walk 20 miles at night back to Jerusalem to go and tell the disciples that they met Jesus. What happened to them was, was the word of God was burning in them. You know what happens? You know what happens when the word of God comes to us as it has been coming to us in December, January, February, and March? Is that the word of God has been burning in us. And our hearts have responded with burning. Our hearts have responded with the desire to obey God and to follow Him and to pursue Him and to do what He is requiring of us today. And so for us, it's not ever about, well, 
the Ten Commandments and those things that the prophets brought in the Old Testament, they're not relevant to us. That's why the New Testament says that all Scripture is given to us for our edification, for our correction, for reproof, and for, to uplift us and exhort us. Yes. All Scripture. So there's things that happen there that we can learn from. There's commandments there that we can learn from. Amen. Praise the Lord. So, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, this is a scripture that we often refer to. I'm going to read it in the New King James Version, 2 Corinthians 10 verse 3. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ and being ready to punish all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. So, what is, what is our major challenge that we have? Our major challenge is not with the continuous perfect state of being that's inside of us. Our major challenge is what's happening inside of here, inside of your mind, in your head. So, I, I want to just remind you, one of, the greatest, one of the greatest revelations, you know, it's amazing to me that the way that God works is, uh, is supernaturally lightning fast, spiritual. You know the revelation that God gave me? Reason, reality, and relevance. Or you can live in redemption, revelation for a revolution. You remember that? God gave me that in about 10 seconds. Have some of this, John. I just wrote it down. Got it, Lord. Now I've got to go study it and bring scripture to it and have God actually confirm it and see it in scripture. Many things are just the way God deals with me. He'll drop a concept. He'll drop an idea. He'll drop something into my heart. And I'll, I'll get it in like seconds. And then, I, then it's up to me to go and get it all. In study. Amen. That's the wonder of God. That's the wonder of God. You see, that's what God's called me to do. Hey? That's what God's called me to do. Our challenge is with Reality, reason, and relevance. That's our challenge. Reality, reason, and relevance. The Bible says, For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments. If you have an argument against what God's doing in this ministry, you can do one of two things. You can take that argument and germinate it, fertilize it, grow it, mature it, verbalize it, and then make a stand on it. Then it becomes your argument that you own against what's happening in the church. Or you can say, hey, I choose to accept what God's doing in this ministry. So I'm not going to argue against it. I may not understand it completely, but I'm not going to argue against it. I'm going to ask God to give me further revelation so that my life can be further redeemed so that I can create a revolution in my own life. That's what that scripture says. 
casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. So what are the high things that are going to exalt themselves against the knowledge of God? What is a high thing? Well, I'll tell you one of the high things is that you think that you're in charge of your financial future. It's a high thing. So bear with me for a minute. If God made Adam and Eve, did he make them in a desert without water, with anything, and then say, Adam and Eve, I've made you now in my image. Go and take care of the stuff that you have to take care of to live with. Did he do that? So what did God do? First, he made the whole environment, and he made the whole environment provide for whoever, whatever he was going to put in there, every living creature. And then at the end, he made Adam and Eve, and he put them in the environment, and he said, I've provided for you. All you have to do is now have the dominion. Control it. They didn't have to work. They just needed to have dominion. They just needed to have dominion. They had to dominate anything that would come in that would bring an argument against the knowledge of God. Isn't that the first thing that happened to Eve? An argument came against the knowledge of God. She entertained the argument. She allowed the argument to take a position in her. So then she acted on the argument because now it's become part of her. And she ate fruit that she shouldn't have eaten. Because she had an argument that came against the knowledge of God. What were they living on until the argument came? Everything that God provided. They didn't have to plant a seed. God said, every seed bearing herb is here for you to eat. All they had to do was pick it and eat it. Everything was provided for them. All they had to do was have dominion. Until an argument came. An argument that came against them. So, an argument that raises itself and is a high thing against the knowledge of God. What are we supposed to do with that? We're supposed to bring it into captivity. Take control of it. Have dominion over that thought. Say, no thought. I'm not going to let you continue in my head. Hey. Praise the Lord. What do you think the enemy, in your spirit now, you have a continuous perfect state of being? in your spirit the devil can't do anything about what's in your spirit now you are a recreated being in the image of God so the continuous perfect state of being is living in you and so that's in you that can never change I know some people say that but it can never change that continuous perfect state of being, by the very definition of God himself that is continuously perfect in you, he can't let that happen. He does write in the book of Hebrews, there is one, there is one thing that you can do that, that, uh, that people can do to undo that salvation. But, I, you know, it's almost impossible to do that. It's almost impossible to do that. So I don't even want to talk about it. Because it's almost impossible to do that. Ultimately, it does reveal a choice. But you have to get so far away from God, having tasted all of the goodness of God, that you then not just are tempted, but you then knowingly choose to say, I'm not going to believe God anymore. Which is almost impossible to do because God is living in you. So then the choice that you make is, 
is a combination of a choice together with a demonic influence that helps you make the choice. Okay? So, the devil can't do anything about the continuous perfect state of being that's in your spirit. But he can do a lot about what's going on in your mind. So he can bring lots of arguments to you that raise themselves up against the knowledge of God. So, arguments that he would raise up is that you are in charge of your financial future. And uh, the, more, the, more you, the more money you can make and uh, the quicker you can make it, the more independent you will be financially. And the quicker you are independent financially, the quicker you don't have to be managed by or controlled by any other system and the more options you will have in life. And so you, you're, all the time what you're doing is you're following an agenda that wants to control, control, to protect, to guard, to put boundaries and do all of that stuff. Now I ask you a question. Do you think God wants to preserve your future he wants to preserve your future do you think God wants you to have an abundant future yes. he said himself I didn't I came to give you life and to give it more life more abundantly if you look at everything that he wanted to do for the children of Israel, every time they turned their hearts towards God and they gave and they did everything God wanted, just blessing upon blessing upon blessing and just abundance upon abundance followed them. Overtook them. So does God want you to have more than enough? Does he want you to be the same as the children of Israel, the covenant children, where he said, you'll be the head and not the tail? Don't you think he said, he, you, you will lend to many nations and you will not borrow? Isn't that what God wants for us? Of course he wants that for us. The difference is he wants us to do it his way, not our way. Because if you're doing it your way, you're always tempted to think it's your money. Is it your money? Hey, even, even if you've done it your way, is it your money now? Now I'm, now I'm really touching on a sore point. Is it your money now? Hey? So, if you don't have any money, it's easy for you to say, no, it's not. But if you've got some money and you've got some assets, then you're going to say, ah, ah, I'm not so sure. Does it belong to God or does it belong to me? Come on, don't. It's an argument that's going to be in your mind. It is an argument that's going to be in your mind. It is. It's my money. It's not God's money. It's mine. I control it. Pastor Sharon shared with you a revelation that a man was, came from America many, many years ago, and he came and he preached it in the church that we were at at the, that time, this message on tithing. That, huh? And offerings, yes. That message. And that, you know, not enough. She, we, she, we heard it 35, 40 years ago for the first time, long time ago. That same man was the man that helped me get out of debt because he wrote a book called War on Debt. And that same man said, I'll show you how to get out of debt because God prospered me so much that I became foolish. I spent and I spent and I spent. Because money was flowing so big. And then the favor of God promoted me. And suddenly my income potential became greater, but my short-term cash flow was diminished. And it's not something that I expected. And so trouble. 
And so that man wrote a book called War on Debt. And uh, it was one of the biggest moments of my life that changed everything. Because I was reading that book. My two little boys, were, we went down to Cape Town. We did a house swap kind of a deal. wasn't exactly, but a, a guy made a house available to us and just said, look after the house in Cape Town. We went down to Cape Town and we went and we went to the Newland swimming pool. as a public swimming pool, beautiful oak trees. And there I was sitting under the oak trees reading this book, War on Debt. And I've told you the story many times. I didn't have anything that the bank didn't own. The car was owned by the bank. The house was owned by the bank. Everything was owned by the bank. I had overdrafts. I had credit cards. I had everything like that. And uh, so then I discovered that I had a computer and a camera. I sold the camera, took the money, gave it to the church, put it in the offering. And I had a computer, which I gave to the Bible school. Those were the only two things that I owned that I could legitimately say was my money our money that we could sow as a seed. And then I started walking around saying, I'm debt free through the miracle power of Jesus. I'm debt free through the miracle power of Jesus. I'm debt free through the miracle power of Jesus. And lo and behold, three and a half years later, I was debt free through the miracle power of Jesus. And my life hasn't changed since then. God has always supernaturally provided. What I had to learn as a lesson at that time was either I was taking credit for what God was doing in, God was doing in my life or I was going to let God take the credit for it. So from that time to this, I don't own my money. God owns my money. Hallelujah. You know what happens if, if you are in a place where, where you can say, because God is, because my, my commitment has been tested. I just, want to, I just want you to know one thing. The reason I shared JD's testimony with you is because Joe McCroskey told me specifically, go and share this with the people. If he shared it with me privately, I wouldn't have shared it with you yesterday. But he wanted you to know it. He told me to share it with you. You know, hey, listen, if God gives Sharon and I an instruction and says, I want you to sow seed into Joe and Joyce's two sons and don't stop until I tell you every year. In dollars. Well, Pastor John. How much money is that going to be? How much money are you going to give away? Because, you know, the rand dollar exchange rate is changing. And, uh, and are you going to be able to afford it? Can you, can you make such a commitment? Well, if God said yes, then of course I can. So then what are you going to get for it? Nothing. There's no transaction here. This is a seed. This is a God-given opportunity to sow seed. And so, so many years later, how many thousands of dollars do you think we have sown seed? Plenty of thousands. You, you might say, well, you know, what could you have done with that money? Pfft, it has no value to me whatsoever, nothing, if I'm not obedient to God. The fact that I've been obedient to God, me and Sharon, and every time we lay hands on that seed, we pray over it, we put it in their hands. Lord, do with it what you need to do with it. Make something happen that needs to happen with it. Years later, John, you know what's happened? Encounter with God. Thank you, Lord, we had a part to play. And that's just the beginning. Because there's things that God has declared over that young man's life that now begins to unfold and the potential of everything that God's called him to do now begins to unfold because he has gone from being someone walking away from God and the church to walking in God and the church. That's just the beginning. Hallelujah. Praise Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So I, you and I, we have to constantly 
manage the arguments that keep on coming into our minds because if you let the arguments grow, you might not think that, they're, that there's anything that's happening to them, but they can become strongholds. And if they become strongholds, they become a place where you, be, you become defensive and you take a defensive position about anything that anybody says against your stronghold argument. So, this is, this is part, of, part of the challenge in, in, uh, in the church. The church at, 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 at large, you have some people that believe, and I'm just talking about generally now, there's some people that believe that God wants us to prosper, and then there's some people that have this belief that God doesn't want everybody to prosper. So they have an argument that they have that is a stronghold, and they stand on their argument with all those people that are prospering. They have an argument against them. Hey? And they defend their position strongly. Hallelujah. Well, that's why I want my heart to always be teachable. And... Uh, and you will find me, sometimes I, um, I might even s sound uh, uh, too kind of self-examining self all the time. But I'd rather be self-examining and have a, a teachable spirit than to be taking strong positions on things. And then never let God deal with anything that's in my life. Hey. Praise the Lord. So, having a teachable spirit doesn't mean to say you can't be a strong person. Right? You can be a strong person and be teachable at the same time. But I don't like, I don't like the, the, the state statement of saying you're a strong-willed person. Because that would be speaking something over someone's life I don't want them to, to know. Because I don't want you to be strong-willed. You can be strong, but not be strong-willed. Eh? Yeah. So, patterns. God's pattern is always designed for our victory. Now, I've talked about the law and the prophets. So, success and failure are predictable patterns. They're predictable patterns. Success and failure is a predictable pattern. Yesterday, I started to address this when I said, I don't want you to measure my success because that means that whatever measurement you've chosen as to measuring my success, now it becomes something that uh, someone else is determining whether you're successful or not. So if you just bear with me, if I've got $10 million cash in the bank and someone, maybe all of you here today, might say he's successful because anybody that's got $10 million cash in the bank is successful. Why would you say that? You would say because anybody that's got $10 million in cash have got control of their future. They can't be influenced by anybody. They can do what they want when they want. And so they must have done some things right to get $10 million in their bank account. You would assume a lot of things that people would measure my success by, right? But just because I've got $10 million cash in the bank doesn't mean I'm successful to Bill Gates. And the other thousand billionaires that are in America, right? What do you think they think about my $10 million? I, I mean, I'm not saying I've got $10 million stashed away in a bank. I'm just saying, if that was the case, what do you think they would say about my $10 million? Uh, well, you want to invite John into a business deal? Sorry, the guy's not, it's not heavy enough. 
because ten million dollars cash in the bank, that's not heavy enough. We're looking for guys that have got a hundred, three hundred, five hundred million dollars in the bank. <laughs> I find it quite amusing. It's quite a sad thing actually, but it is quite amusing. They take Trump to court for defrauding somebody. They don't know nobody got defrauded. They put a four hundred million dollar penalty on him. Then the judge reduces it to $175 million. And they say, how are you going to pay for it? I'm going to pay cash for it. That must drive all of the Democrats crazy. <laughs> I'll write a check. <laughs> well, why didn't you want to give the $500 million? Well, I've got to pay for my campaign. I want to become president again. So I need the, four, the $300 million so I can pay for becoming president again. And so now I'm told he's got this, uh, this uh, new, he's got this venture, True Social or whatever. It's doing some kind of, I don't know, it's a new stock exchange thing that's happening in America. And, uh, and so now they're saying that if this deal happens, he's going to be worth $4 billion. So, have anybody read it? Hidden, looks like you've read about it, you, Simon. I mean, this is, I'm not, this is real stuff happening. So, so you know, so here's what they say about him. They say, it's like everything that Donald Trump touches turns to gold. It drives them crazy. It drives them crazy. I'll tell you one thing Donald Trump has done is that when he became president, he got all of the Christian pastors into the White House and he started having prayer meetings with them. I wonder what you think that did to all the evil spirits of power and control that were controlling the White House and the deep state government in America when Donald Trump walked in there and started having Holy Ghost-filled spirit prayer meetings in the White House. Nuts is what happened. They went so nuts that they were doing everything they can to keep him from becoming president again. Anyway, I took a sidetrack there. <laughs> yes, if Donald Trump comes to me and says, John, let's do business together, how much money you got? And I say, $10 million, sorry, you're a bit light. Because I'm dealing in hundreds of millions of dollars. So how you measure success is actually not really valid to anybody else from anybody else the only measurement that you might want to use for success is, uh, is where do I want to be? Where do I want to be? Is that money? Where do I want to be in relationships? Where do I want to be where? You can't just take one thing and measure yourself and say the one thing. So now if you start measuring yourself, you're going to get into yourself also a position where, hey, I don't have enough. I want more. I've got news for you. You're never going to have enough. You're always going to want more. So you're, if you're using a measurement system of success, you're always going to be dissatisfied. Always. So, let's take the thoughts of measuring success captive. And let's say, let's stop measuring success. Why don't we just say, let's stop measuring success? Why don't we rather just live in a state where we live in obedience to God? Why don't we just say we are constantly living in obedience to God? Because if you want to say, are you successful? My answer is, are you obeying God? And then you can talk about any part of your life you want to talk about. Are you obeying God in your marriage? Are you obeying God in tithes and offerings and giving? Are you obeying God in, in business transactions that he's bringing your way, that you can put your hand to, that he's, he's put that in your scope so that you can be blessed because he's blessing you in that business transaction? And are you going to give glory to God while you're doing that business? Sometimes 
there's big adjustments and then sometimes there's smaller adjustments. But being in business, if you're giving God glory all the time, when you're in business, I promise you, your business is going to be blessed. Don't hide what you're doing in business. Don't hide your Christianity in your business. So if you're hiding your Christianity, it means that there's a level of lack of confidence in your Christianity. Don't let the devil lie to you. That's an argument you can't win. Take that argument captive and say, my Christianity is not dependent on my perfection. My Christianity is because I have got a perfect continuous state of being living inside of me and I don't have to apologize for my imperfection. But I'm happy to be open about my imperfection in case they judge my maker, my perfectly created one, by my imperfection. So I'd rather talk to you about my imperfections that I take responsibility for than you judging the, the continuous perfect state of being one based on my imperfection. Rather judge my imperfection than judge my God. And so if you don't want to know about my God because of my imperfection, that's on you. Now, if we have a whole bunch of Christians going into business, you know, talking about God and saying, I'm not here to come and preach to you Jesus all day long. I'm here to do business with you. But I want you to know I am a Christian. I am a believer. He is the Lord and Savior of my life. And I'm going to give him time. Noted. You think the Muslims don't do that? The Muslims do that. They're going to tell you, we can't do business with you on certain days of the week because we're in prayers. And they'll tell you, don't write me for lunch, a business lunch on certain days of the, of the month because we're doing fasting. So why can't we do that as Christians? I'll tell you why, because Christians have got a bad name. Don't we? We have a bad name. By the end of this weekend, I'm hoping to redeem the name of Christian to you. I'm hoping that you and I will get to an agreement that we don't have to call ourselves Christians and with a bad name. I'm going to give you a worse name. I'm going to give you a name, Terminator, Dominator, Destroyer, Stronghold Obliterator. Hallelujah. No, I am. I'm going to give you a name that you can live by, that you can, you can talk by, that will identify you as one that follows Christ. And it could be a place that if people ask you, well, what do you mean by that? That you can give them a proper answer by what you mean by that. Because I want to tell you, I'm not the same Christian as someone else that goes and confesses to a priest once a month and he, and he lives his life in whatever order of life he wants to live in. I'm not the same Christian as him. I don't want to be labeled as the same Christian as him. I don't want to be labeled the same as a Christian that's every Friday night found in a pub. Every Saturday they get up at midday because they're drunk from the night before. And before the weekend's over, the amount of weed that they've smoked, 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 you know, is enough to put a donkey to sleep. That's probably not that much because donkeys sleep on their feet. <laughs> but you get my meaning. Yeah. Praise the Lord. <laughs> no, I mean, uh, there are some things that, that, you know, we feel like as Christians, the grace life allows us to have a life that we can just live as we want to live. And, and so, you know, it's okay and, and we can just be whatever. I'm not also suggesting that our moral standard should be the moral standard by which we make a difference in the earth. Because... If you begin to stand for a moral standard, you're going to compromise yourself somewhere along the line. And someone will find the moral standard weakness that you have. And it can be anybody, anywhere, anytime. That just has a different moral compass to you. So now your moral standard becomes 
the thing that they can get you on because your moral standard is different to theirs. So morality is not something that we should even measure our success by either. What we should be living with is the continuous perfect state of being is living inside of me and now I want that life to be living with me everywhere I live. Everything I say, everything I do, everywhere I go, now I'm being successful. Because my success is eternal, continuous, perfect state of being flowing through me. Okay? Are you all with me still? Because... Uh, as we move through, we're going to talk about something that's quite important because we as a people have to be success minded, but not success measuring. We have to be, we have to be people that are victorious, not conquered. We must be conquerors, not be defeated. We've got to be the people that God says we are above and not beneath. We are blessed going out and blessed coming in. We have to have that in our mindset. Amen. So before I get into the next section of what, what I'm going to minister on, I want to ask you if you think our education system in South Africa is good for our kids. Anybody? No. So it's bad, right? I would agree. So, God put it in my heart 20 years ago that our education for our system for our kids is, is bad. We've got to find an alternative. And so, hence I got up in front of the church and said, if, if I could give you advice, homeschool your kids. Amen. And so, time has gone by. Many people in the, ch in, many people in the church have homeschooled their kids. Some have, have, have done it this way. Some have done it another way. All kinds of things have been happening. But over the last, can we say, over the last five years, it's just like it was bad, 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 and now it's got terrible. Yes? It's just horrible, terrible. And it's getting worse. It's on free fall. It's not, there's nothing catching it to say it's on a different trajectory now. It's just getting worse. Right? So. We are, in a, we are in a momentum in our ministry now of creating an alternative education opportunity that we can, we can collaborate with parents. We can collaborate together as a ministry. We can collaborate together so that we can provide fantastic education from a math science reading, writing, point of view, as well as an education system that provides young people, little kids, with a purposeful, integrated life with God. Don't you think that's what God wanted for His covenant kids when He signed up with Abraham? In fact, He said to Abraham, all the nations of the earth will, because I know you will teach your children after me. Not after other gods, after me. So, I, I want, I'm wanting you to understand this, that, uh, that we, are, we are very, very close to just bringing everything together to make it happen. Yeah. I'm just saying, that if
that the next step, God's going to pay for. Because that has to happen next. Because this thing is, in my heart, this thing has got to happen yesterday. Can't wait anymore. It's got to happen. It's got to happen quickly. So, for years, you know, I mean, I just want to show you how God works this thing out. God, God put this in my heart. Don't build a church that's based on how many numbers can come and how big you can build an organization. Build a church that's re- built on relationship. Established biblical order. Yes? You've all been a witness to that. You're all part of that. On that basis... I mean, part of the testimony that Christian Krobi says, Pastor Christian Krobi says, part of that tes- testimony is I went and had coffee with them one day and she has said it many times from her pulpit and I read their mail. And they were like, yeah, and Krobi's walked out and he said, yeah, that Pastor John, he knows us exactly. He knows who we are and like we have freedom to be who we are in, in this church. And then the Lord spoke to Pastor and Christy and said, no, that's not... Uh, a pat on the back, that's actually a very poor thing because you people that just want to do whatever you want to do. I never told her that. God told her that. But I just want you to see something. So God begins to deal with her. I think God Krobis came to his, his sane mind. <laughs> Took him a few years, but he got there. He got there. <laughs> but, but you can't, you can, see, if someone's got a revelation, you can't stop the revelation from pulling you into your destiny. And God was calling her into destiny. And I'll tell you what, husbands and wives, if God's calling you into your destiny, God will call you even if your husband or your wife is not willing to come with you. You obey God, God will deal with your spouse. This is a truth I'm telling you. This is not something to, so, to create a vision. This is a truth that God calls everybody to a destiny. He doesn't just call you as a couple. If I didn't recognize Pastor Sharon's gift of the, of the prophet in her and her gift of worship that God placed in her, he would have fulfilled that destiny another way even though I didn't see it. But because he called us together, he's created an opportunity for her here because that was his original intent. Anyway, that's for free. I didn't intend to say that. But anyway, so, but God spoke to her. God starts to deal with her. She becomes a disciple of what God is doing. Just as we were disciples of Kenneth Hagin, Jerry Savell, Kenneth Copeland, she was a disciple of not only them, but she became a disciple of this messenger. Right? So this disciple then begins to touch her family. Am I right, family? So the family starts to get touched by her. So now this family here, the Dutoy family, they get touched by this one. She starts to pray with them on the telephone first. First on the telephone because there wasn't Zoom and Skype those days. As far as I remember, it was noch früher da, ne? Oh, they drove through. In the early year, they drove through every week to go and pray with them on the phone. Every week or close to it. Every now and again, every two weeks. That's a commitment to go and pray with them. Eventually, they decide, no, this thing is burning in us. This message is burning us. This thing is, this is, if we we really believe this stuff, we've got to act on this. Hey, Loki and Zelda, that's what happened to you. God started drawing you. And when God started drawing them, I'm getting someplace. I'm not just... So when God started drawing them, they, they, they started to say, we've we got to make some changes. We've got to make some changes. We've got to make some changes. Are you getting me? We've got to make some changes. Because if we think God's drawing us, we've got to make some changes. We've got to make some changes. We've got to make some changes. So the change that, they, I mean, he, he's a fourth generational farmer. He's not just going to leave his farm behind. There are other things at stake. But so they made the changes that they could make. And one of those, we're going to drive through to Whitbank every Sunday and we're going to come to church every Sunday and we're going to have prayer meetings on Tuesday night. Now there's technology involved and they have prayer meetings in Morgenstern. Watch this. 
She was running a school. Zelda was running a school in her house because she can, because she's, she's capable educationally, allowed to. She's running a school. Before I even met her, I had a vision. I was on the board of someone who tried to change the education system by buying a whole school and by running it in a Christian school way. And I was on that board and it wasn't working. They were just creating another school, but put a Christian name on it and it just became another school. I said, sorry, I can't be with you because that's not the vision I have in my heart. I'm talking 25 years ago, 30 years ago. But I'm praying into it. I'm speaking into it. I'm not allowing the arguments that you can't make a difference to come into my head. Every, every now and again, I fussed with that. I had to fight with that. And if you think you're ever going to walk a journey with God where your arguments don't get loud in your head, you're mistaken. You're going to have to take those arguments and fight those things and take them and wrestle them under control so that they don't dominate your future. It's like a wrestling match. That's what that scripture talks. It's, it's like a wrestling match. You've got to take hold of it and you've got to wrestle it. Control it. So, all the while, God's doing something behind the scenes. Doing something behind the scenes. So now, now, and I'm just going to say, now we're in a position where somewhere along the line, God brought Marty. Marty started to connect with us. We had to find each other. Marty is part of this Ecclesia now. She wanted me to understand that she was part of this Ecclesia because she came into my office with a spade, a big spade. And I said, Marty, what are you doing with this spade? She says, oh, this spade is digging a tree. It's big, digging a hole for a tree because I'm planted. To her, she wanted me to see the visualization of the intent of her heart that she's planted. That's something that God does in her. That's not something that I asked her to do. But that's something that God did in her. Now, Marty has got, how many years, Marty? 25 years? 25 years of dedicating 25 years of her life to helping people homeschool their kids. She's sitting next to Zelda, who did a school that was a combination of ACE and homeschooling, kind of. I don't want to get technical about it. I was giving you a... A highlight. Now I've got people here. I mean, I think if LaRue could and he wanted to, he would have probably been a teacher by gifting, not an engineer by profession. Because that's what he loves to do. And Liesl, she's an occupational therapist. Her whole life is helping people learn things that can't learn things. Is that broadly speaking? More or less. Amper. Oh, suddenly, and I'm just touching the headlines. I've got Tertia there, and Tertia has done homeschooling successfully. She's part of the team here, working in this ministry, coming, helping us form. Tertia, thank you. All of these people, thank you. They come together every, every other week. They come together, and I'm, Da's not here. Angie's not. Where's Lebu? Lebu's here. Lebu's not here. When I call out people's names, they seem to be everywhere else. I called Taryn the other day and she was buying rolls at Checkers for your lunch. <laughs> anyway, God's put together a team. Garth and Marcel, they're all they're in this team together and they're all working in this team because the vision has come. Yes. The vision has yes. come. This ecclesia has arrived to bring something. It came on the back of our exchanges coming in their numbers to come and exchange their lives for God's life. I wonder if God's got a plan happening here. I wonder if he didn't start this plan so many years ago and we're just now saying it's building time. It's building time. You know, when you dig the foundations of a, of a house, when you dig a foundations of a house, it doesn't look like anything. It's just, it's just sand in the, in the it's, just hole, it's just a hole in the ground. And you look at it and you look at it and, you, and, and in your mind, if you don't have an architect's plan or an engineer's plan and you can't, you look at it, 
let his, she designs houses. If you don't look at the plan, you say, this is just a bunch of holes in the ground. And then they come and put cement in it. You say, okay, now there's cement in the holes. Now what? You know? But it's only when they start building on top of that and you say, oh, this is where the lounge, are. here's the wall, and this is where the bathroom's going to be, this is where the kitchen's. It's kind of, okay, I can see it's happening now. The product hasn't arrived yet, but it's nearly there. Because the design has happened. The foundation's been laid. Now the building is happening. In God's time. I believe that God is building here. A place for him. That is built on the rock. <laughs> because he said to Peter, on this revelation, this rock, I will build my church. He also said, you can build a house on sand or you could build a house on the rock. When the, when, the, when the beatings of life come, the house on sand won't stand, but the house on the rock will weather the storm. I'll tell you, this ministry has had many storms that try to blow us off course, but we have been founded on the rock. We have been founded on the rock. Hallelujah. We are founded on the rock. Hallelujah. Praise Jesus. And so... Church, uh, you know, here we, here we are. I, I, I uh, don't want to talk too much about all of the stuff that God is doing in, um, in and around us. But we are just at the beginning. We are just at the beginning. So do we know, do we know what the farm is going to be for? I can tell you, whatever we think the farm's going to be for, it's going to be, it's going to be for much more than we think the farm's going to be for. It's going to be much more than that. It's not just a piece of land with a couple of cows on it and a few chickens to show the kids what real life like was before, before the internet arrived. <laughs> Go and play in the mud. No, God's got a destiny. God's got a plan. God's, God's working it. He's working it. He's working, He's, working it. He's working it. He's working it. And this that we're doing this weekend by giving him first fruits, you think this is just a little thing and now our holidays are all going to get taken care of. Hi, corner winner. That's just too small a bar. That's just too a lower bar to think this is what first fruits are. It's that and much, much, much more. It's a combination of, hey, you guys are all prepared to come together, flow together, bring all of your energy, all of your time, all of giving up, all of your vacation time, all of the stuff that has brought you to here, all of this, God's taking all of it as first fruits. And he says, let me see what I can bless with this. Let me see what I can bless with this. Hallelujah. So, when you come back, when I come back, someone else is going to preach. Pastor Garth is going to preach after lunch. And so if you know Pastor Garth, he's got something groovy to say. I will come back to this scripture after lunch. After, after I returned to Jerusalem, I was praying in the temple and fell into a trance. I saw a vision of Jesus saying to me, hurry, leave Jerusalem, for the people here won't accept your testimony about me. I'm going to talk to you about trances and visions. <laughs> Glory to Jesus. Glory to Jesus. So when you go and have lunch, please don't get into a trance. Wake up, wake up, what are you doing? Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Don't come back in a food haze. <laughs> I bless the food in Jesus' name. May it do your body good and not any harm. May your body absorb it properly and correctly and may it only do good to your body. And I pray that nobody, I'm not any, anybody that's cooked food, this is not against you, just making sure that everybody's body receives it properly and that there are no adverse effects to the food that you eat in this lunchtime. You all agree? Say amen. amen. I'll see you after lunch, two o'clock. 
The voice of my shepherd, no other I know. The voice of my shepherd tells me where to go. He leads and he guides me in every way. I listen to only what he has to say. He speaks through his word to his prophets. He speaks through his word to his prophets. He's the shepherd of my heart. He's the shepherd of my life.